Well, hello, everyone. This is John Good. Byrne again with Poets and Quants. Welcome to Fridays with Sandy. We have a jumbo score to talk about, a Canadian applicant. Uh, his name is Austin. He has a 770 GMAT. Wow. A 3.4 GPA. He works in wealth management for the Royal Bank of Canada. And he's applying the Harvard Wharton Columbia Booth NYU Stern and Cornell because he wants to transition into investment banking. Sandy Kreisberg is there in Boston, ready to go. Hi, Sandy. Uh, hi, hi, John. Hi, Austin. Good to meet you again. Uh, I'm impressed. What we got here, as I mentioned in our preview, is uh, we got a, a low GPA and a high GMAT. We call that a uh, unattractive spouse with a dowry. And then the question is, <laughs> what, what business school, business schools have been done to marry people like that, uh, as well as uh, human beings have been known to do that too. That's what makes it interesting. So your question is, who's going to buy the 3-4 to get the 770 and uh, with a career that's uh, pretty solid. Just tell us about your job. Uh, what is uh, the, 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 what, what's it like working at the Royal Bank of Canada? Do, do, do they typically send people to business schools? Um, I'm not sure. Out of my group, there's only six people. So obviously no one has been to business school, but the Royal Bank of Canada is Canada's largest bank. Um, it's over 80,000 employees. Yeah, so yeah. It's I'm a great brand. I'm interested in your group. Uh, okay, John, let, let, let me ask you this. Well, um, you say you're working for Cooper Wealth Management. Is that a branded subsidiary? What's the Cooper part? Yeah, that's um, just the name of the two advisors I work for. Um, so we have two advisors. That's our group within RBC Dominion Securities. RBC Dominion Securities has like 5,000 different groups, um, each with their own name for each advisor. So these guys are kind of entrepreneurs working within the bank, if I got that right. Yeah, yeah. They started their own wealth management practice with their own book of assets. It's just under the RBC Dominion Securities umbrella. <clears throat> John, is that good or bad for applying to business school? I think the key question is how highly selective. Uh, there you go. The Selectivity is the, the answer to all of Sandy's questions. And I'm assuming that a lot of people would love to have your job and a lot of people compete for it. Am I right? Uh, well, my job's fairly unique in that um, it didn't even exist until I went in and talked to the two guys and I guess impressed them enough that they created a job um, so that I could join their team. Okay, tell me what you, tell, tell the folks what you do because you, you, you seem to be a quanti techie guy and you're involved in a lot of, you know, like you trade, you know, covered calls. I don't even know what that is and options and stuff. Uh, so could just briefly tell us what you do. Yeah. So I'm on the portfolio management side for our book. Um, it's a discretionary book. So it's twofold. Um, I run our covered call program. So for everyone that's eligible, I pick the contracts, write the contracts um, and monitor them, trying to move out if we're going to get exercise on the contract, if profitable. And then the second part is I look for new investment ideas, bring them to the portfolio manager. If we decide to go ahead, I handle the buy and sell as well. Yeah. What you actually do is a lot more than uh, the standard investment banker applicant who is just usually doing diligence on stuff. You actually have a wider diversity of tasks and more innovation and develop more ideas. You just don't have a conventional job. Uh, uh, from a from the admissions committee's point of view, uh, what what you need to do is explain what you do very clearly, and what you have to mention is the teamwork part of it, and the customer interface. In other words, you, what you have to say is I'm more than a quant tool, which uh, this resume. Uh, uh, could lead one to believe if it were read quickly, which it often is. So you, you have to present yourself as someone who 
uh, interacts with a lot of people and uh, uh, helps people, works on teams, yada, yada, yada. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree, John? Yeah, because he sound, it sounds like you have a uh, actually a, a fairly broad range of responsibility, including uh, some client relationship work and bringing good ideas uh, to the team, investment ideas. So that's, that's much broader than just, you know, being a numbers uh, monkey in the back, just working spreadsheets and models. Yes, being well put. Uh, okay. University now, of now Sandy, I, I think a lot of people out there uh, we'll look at that 770 and say, oh, my God, how does anyone score a 770? I mean, that's in the top 1% of all the test takers of GMAT in a given year, yeah. top 1%. And, and I wonder, you know, give us a little sense of how hard it was to get a 770. Uh, I know, Austin, you've taken the test two times. The first time you did sure. really well is, uh, uh, with a 710 right out the gate. Uh, but but give our, our folks a little idea of how in the world did you get a 770? Yeah, I mean, um, coming from a quantity background, as you guys have said, um, the quant stuff um, wasn't too bad for me. I kind of started out with a fairly high quant score, um, just kind of dialed down on some of the areas where I was a little rough. And then I had to put in a ton of work on the verbal stuff, um, actually. Uh, I figured it would be a little bit easier being a native speaker, but um, it's not quite as intuitive as I thought. So I ended up putting in a good two months or so on mostly yeah. verbal practice before good I got for the you. Let, let me tell you something. You had a 710 and then you decided to retake it, right? Yep. You did the right thing. You, you, you're a totally different person. This resume with a 710 is um, much less uh, impactful than with the 770. You really Especially for a white guy, white guy in finance, right, Sandy? Yeah, correct, yeah, white finance guy, uh, which is a, um, we don't call that a bucket, we call that a vase, a, a, a white finance guy. <laughs> There's a lot of them, uh, and a lot of them are really smart. So uh, the 770 uh, helps distinguish you from, a, from otherwise, some generic uh, but impressive cohort of white finance guys. Yeah, that, that's that, and that's kind of who that's kind of who you're competing with. Uh, then the question is how how punishing is the three four going to be? Uh, and you and you got a you got a three six in a master's program. I got a three six here someplace. No, I got a three six in my major. Within econ, I got a three six. The three fours dragged down because when I transferred, I had to do a year as a biology student. And oh, okay. Wasn't great. Yeah. Plus you were playing plus you were playing varsity baseball, which is incredibly demanding, particularly if you're on the mound and you're pitching as you were. That's correct, yes. You gotta explain that. You you you, you might say that the, the, the standard riff is my three, four is not predictive of my performance at your business school. Uh, you know, here's, here, here are the factors that went into it. Did, did you have a period like in your last two years where the, the grades went, where the GPA went up? Yeah, in my yeah, last two years, I got to take um, purely econ classes and I did significantly better, yeah. Yeah, and that's in Worth econ, noting. which is often a tough grade. You got to you got to get all that in in that little essay they give you to explain yourself. That's the, the other than that, this is um, a, a very powerful story. Uh, now, Sandy, I know that uh, the admissions people like uh, applicants who excelled at college athletics. Austin was rookie of the year and played varsity baseball for four years. Does that matter? I'm not so sure. You raise an interesting question, John. I'm not so sure admissions committees at, at, at business schools care about college athletics. And if they care, they certainly don't care about how good you were, okay? Uh, if they care, they care about if you had a leadership role. So what, what you should stress about the athletics is whether you were the, the 
manager, you know, the player manager or the captain of the team. And if you, when you talk about it, you should talk about it as a, a leadership experience, not an athletic experience. This is critical. Uh, admissions committees, as we've said many times, are frequently composed of uh, MBA moms. You want to define that for our listeners, John? Ah, uh, right. Well, an MBA mom is a, a nice, nice lady who's well-meaning, but uh, may not understand the intricacies of a sport or a military career. Just, just tell us what it means. It's, it's, it's a woman who has an MBA and then w got an MBA, worked for a couple of years, maybe, uh, and then uh, started a family and uh, kind of dropped out of the full-time workforce and became an admissions officer. I don't want to say an admissions officer isn't a full-time job, but it's frequently women with MBAs. So they're, they're, not, they're not jock sniffers as a rule. <laughs> now also, you know, Austin, I'm thinking if you were on the team for four years and you pitched, probably in your senior year, you were mentoring uh, the younger pitchers on the, on the team. Yeah, that's something I tried to do really for my first year at Waterloo because I played in the States before too, which is significantly more intense than Canadian college baseball. So uh -huh. right from the moment I got on campus, I tried to be um, sort of a mentor to those first year guys that were just getting to college too and trying to balance both class and baseball as I'd already been through it, right? Yeah, so that, that goes to what Sandy said, that that's what you want to emphasize probably. Yeah, not something I've been relying on my, my essays. Teamwork, so development, you want to treat it like a business, but they, they, to the extent they care about athletics, they care about leadership, cap, being a captain, being a mentor, being an assistant to the actual coach, blah, blah. You, you got the picture. That's the way I would talk about your athletic career. Uh, what, 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 what job do you want after business school? Yeah, after base, uh, business school, I want to transition to investment banking, preferably in the uh, M&A product group. Okay, you can do that. Can't you do that now? Um, sure, I could, but twofold for why I want to go to business school. First off, I want to transfer to the U.S. Um, if I'm going to be a banker, I want to do it in the biggest market, working on the biggest deals. And then I want to get those leadership skills again, business school too, that are going to serve me as I move up. Um, and banking becomes more of a client facing bringing in business type deal. Okay. So Sandy, is that a good answer for why I want an MBA for him? Well, yeah, it's a good answer. Well, it's a good answer to an MBA committee who have to swallow that bullshit. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a very good answer. I mean, I just, uh, it makes sense. But, but, right? but, just between, but just between me and you, Austin, we're talking about two years and a half a million dollars. If you know what I'm saying. Buddy, yeah, also no, you're gonna right. make a ton of money. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you might be right, John. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, if, let me tell you, your well, well, this is part of my analysis. Your problem is you don't have enough gold on your resume. So if you got into uh, a top business school, you, you you know you could use the, it's it's a great basis for networking, you know, and and it's a great way. Just to, just to have on your resume. It's also, it's a great experience. You meet a lot of uh, high powered people, both your classmates and, and the faculty, so. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think an MBA makes a lot of sense for you given what you wanna do, uh, working in the United States in the biggest you know, investment banking market there is for a bulge bracket type bank or an elite boutique M&A place. Um, and, you know, this is right. Uh, Sandy's right on here. You know, obviously, War University of Waterloo is very well known, uh, but it's not, uh, you know, gold plated like uh, Harvard, Columbia, uh, Wharton, the schools that you're applying to. So this would this will provide some like gold glitter on your CV. Yeah, he knows. Oh, good. OK, let's. Uh, so what let's are his, what's his shot? What is, what's his chances at Harvard? Let's let's just he 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 he's interested in Harvard, Wharton, Columbia, Booth, NYU, and Cornell. Okay, I believe the seven seventy and a and a standard application, one that does no harm, 
would get you into Columbia, Booth, NYU, and Cornell. So uh, you should get into those places. Bort Wharton, okay, John, tell me, tell me what I'm gonna say about Wharton. Well, I've got a lot of people in, in this cohort in the applicant pool. On the other hand, not many of them are necessarily Canadians. And so the fact that he's coming from Canada could be a plus. Also, I'm just going to tell you, you know, investment banking isn't what it used to be. So most, most uh, young people, they want to go into hedge funds. They want to go actually into wealth management. They want to go into private yeah, equity, yeah, they, venture capital. About, well, John, Morton doesn't care about well, I, I think Wharton needs more people who want to go into investment banking who are really great people. That, that, that's going to happen or not. They're, they're not going to select for that. All, all business schools care about is the past. Because the future, the future is just people will say anything and people change their mind. You know? what, what, what's Wharton going to go for here? Oh, they're going to go for that GMAT score. My God, they're going to fall over themselves. Yeah, Wharton... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, that, that 770 might get you into Wharton. Okay, they're yeah. a sucker. They're a sucker for big scores. They they really trust them. They believe in it. So, so what do you I, think his odds are at Wharton? You're you're saying he's definitely going to get into Columbia, Booth, NYU, and Cornell. What do you think his he odds are? He should get into those schools if okay if he can execute and convince them he wants to go there. That's that's the problem. Uh, right. Just nominal execution. We don't need anything fancy. Just don't do, do no harm. Don't say anything stupid. It's what I say to everybody. Wharton, you're going to have to get in, you, get in a Wharton. You're going to have to uh, write an essay that shows you really know the program, that you want your program, that you're interested in quantity kind of stuff, uh, and that the, why the school would be good for you. They, they fall for that. Uh, and yeah, find you know, the superstar <laughs> eye banking professor or two and take a really good look at their electives and how deep they go and and talk about that. Yeah, blah blah blah. They, they go for that. Okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath and say this. Uh, I don't think you're getting into Harvard, really with a 770. <laughs> There's too many guys like you that that they would like more. So what do you say his odds are at Harvard? Are they 10, 15, 20? I think his odds of being interviewed are 25%. Okay. Uh, I just think they see a lot of guys like you. And, um, you know, as, as far as they're concerned, this is true with Wharton, but Wharton will go for the 770. As, as far as Harvard's concerned, you know, well, uh, let me let me put it to you, Austin. Wh wh why should they take you versus other guys? You know, who who, were, who are uh, investment bankers at uh, you know um, Goldman, uh, Morgan Stanley, JP yeah, the standard uh, water lineup from Harvard, yeah. Stanford, Princeton. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, I guess the one thing I could bring is a bit of a different perspective from other people in the finance bucket. I do deal with clients on a more granular scale, like normal everyday people um, investing their life savings. So it is a little bit of a different perspective than someone that's um, at an investment bank dealing with companies instead of just people. This yeah, is they got real, people, they got really people from point. investment banks that deal with wealth management. But this is a really good point, Sandy, because now we're talking about how does he differentiate himself in a highly competitive pool at Harvard against, you know, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton crowd that's at Goldman Sachs and Blackstone already doing something and want to do something else. And that he got right there. That's a good answer. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> I, I, that, that, that might be the best answer under the circumstances. That's why, yeah. look, hey, hey, I like you a lot, Austin. I, I just don't think you're getting in. Uh, I, I could be wrong. Uh, but you want to uh, drill that home uh, uh, in your, you know, in your uh, essay to Harvard. Uh, how, and, and, how, and what it means to, to build relationships, cultivate them with, 
with clients uh, who are investing their life savings and the responsibility and accountability that goes with that. Cause that, that you know, goes beyond the whole numbers jockey stuff that a lot of other yeah, people. Yeah, but I, John, let, let's try and get a little more specific here. The, 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 the Harvard essay question is what else do you want us to know about you? What's the answer, Austin? Yeah, I was gonna go with, I mean, the template that you tell everybody, these are my goals. And then I was gonna lay out some of my influences. Um, so biggest influence is obviously building those relationships with people. And I mean, the responsibility that I have that I'm dealing with regular everyday people's retirement savings or education savings. For is, the there, is there, is there, any, that. is there any political correctness, something in your story? I realize you're a, a, a white guy from Canada working for a bank right. uh, in wealth management uh, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't get you in contact with a lot of underrepresented minorities, but is there anything like it in your background? Or in your customers um, you've dealt with or? Not overly, no. We do have a diverse client base just based on the diversity of Canada as a whole, um, but no um, super big like X factor, like you would say for a Stanford or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, what, so let what, me let me pose a question here, uh, and it may be relevant or not. Uh, Austin, do you work with people who are immigrants uh, who have their life savings basically with your firm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Canada is very open to immigration, and right, we exactly. do have clients that are immigrants to Canada, and so, we do have some international clients as well, right? So, yeah, so, so I that's, wonder. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good part of an essay. Yeah, I wonder if telling your story about the responsibility that you feel, uh, you bring up an anecdote of a, a immigrant family to Canada and your responsibility to them. Yeah, yeah and, and that's why you want to go into private equity? No, investment banking, not <laughs> private <laughs> equity. <laughs> People who go into investment banking often wind up in private equity. John. That's true. That is a stepping stone to PE, definitely. Uh, that, that's a story worth developing. Uh, uh, is there anything in your own background? Are your, your parents, you know, uh, first gen or did they go to college, anything like that? Uh, my dad went to college, which is the Canadian equivalent of community college in the U.S. And then my mom went to university. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're a regular white guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, what Sandy's looking for is something that just takes you a little bit more out of the bucket, you know, give you some a little bit more advantage. I, I, I think the way you positioned it, that's what you got. Go with it. It's good. Um, tie it into the, the sense of teamwork at uh, doing playing varsity ball. Uh, use a, a anecdote of a. Hey, Austin, let, let me. Uh, the, the, the baseball thing might be a strong thing. Yeah. We, did you have a leadership role on the team or you just were a, a cranky pitcher? <laughs> I mean, we didn't have um, set captains or anything like that, yeah. but um, coming from the U.S. where it was a much more intense environment than Canadian baseball, I did try to be a mentor to um, the younger guys on the team, specifically younger pitchers. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd make that uh, a segment of your uh, essay. One of the influences of being a mentor to pitchers on the baseball team. And, and, I, and I think that that means more than just showing them how to throw a more effective curveball. You know, a lot of uh, pitching and a lot of baseball is psychological and boosting someone's confidence. And I think that that would be a really good story to tell in your essay. Well, I agree. Uh, if they were having trouble adjusting to the team or, you know, or if they were having trouble out, outside of the technicalities of playing baseball, uh, you know, I, I you know, I, I was just helpful to pitchers who were first gen college or seemed a little confused or did lack confidence, the general stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're just throwing stuff out. If in the back of your mind you're saying, man, nothing like that happened. Then Try and make it happen on the application, okay? No, it's something <laughs> I've talked about too. And, you don't uh, have to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've tied it back to to my own experiences. Like when I went to the States and I was 17 years old moving to another country, there was older guys that also 
took me in as kind of a mentee. So I tied it yeah, to that's a, that's how I had that angle. experience and yeah. then brought it back with me. Right? Yeah, the b- baseball had allowed me to become a, uh, a mentor, both a mentor and a mentee. And it was very important to me. Yeah, that's really good. That was a, so big, look, a big influence. So Sandy, you think he's a no-brainer for four schools, likely at Wharton. And the big question is Harvard. Here's the other thing, you know, Chicago Booth is going to throw money at you because they want that 770 uh, in their class score. So you're going to have to decide, okay, do I want to take Booth's money or do I, would I rather go to Wharton or Columbia? Uh, And then Harvard's a wild card, you know, maybe, maybe not. Right. Yeah, it's a wild card. Let me just say one of my famous sayings is Harvard doesn't blink twice. They blink once. So they would they would blink at the three at four the three four yeah but you're also asking them to blink at the fact that you're in wealth management which is not to their mind selective uh, and and there's a lot of guys like you uh, I, I, that's my analysis nothing, nothing personal man well that's why I think he wants to play up the prestige of working for this this kind of like boutique within uh, the Royal Bank of Canada that obviously these the two guys who run the fund uh, must have a, a great reputation to attract capital. Uh, <laughs> what you have to do is explain how influential working uh, in your job is and it influenced you in that you enjoy helping people with their finances. It's an interesting way to meet people and help people. Finance is something that makes people nervous. You're interested in putting them at ease. You know, that's the way I would approach that part of the job. Uh, and if, if the two guys you work for are mentors, that could be another influence. You know, Joe, Joe Blow taught me, you know, how, how to do this and you know, John Smith taught me how to do this, this, and this. That's the way I would play the job. And you enjoy, uh, uh, you know, being influential and helping people. All right. Uh, they there you have it. The 770. There you have it. Austin, good luck to you. Uh, Sandy, thank you for that assessment. I think we kind of worked how you should... Uh, play the Harvard application in particular, where we think that's the reach school. Uh, Let's see if you get in, let us know, okay? (laughs) All right, will do, thanks guys. All right, you take care, good luck. And Sandy, thanks again. And for all of you out there, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You've been watching Fridays with Sandy.